tell you that I have gospel bones. That was phenomenal. Thank you, Teresa. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we could add this year, and I also shall rise. Let's try that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And I also shall rise. That's a key component, don't you think? He is risen. He is risen indeed. But we also will rise because he rose. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know what? I'm going to insert at this point in time a poem. Um, Vanessa Fight, a member of our congregation, uh, has given me a poem. And I don't know that I'll do it justice, but I want to read it. Um, it's called A Journey for Jesus. The week started Sunday, a bright, sunny day, with large crowds of people waving palms, paving the way. Watching a donkey walk down the city street as Jesus, our shepherd, rode for many to greet. The angels watched down from high above, Shining a bright light of God's own special love. Jesus healed and taught those in the huge throngs each day of the week as it went on and on. The disciples, his close and very dear friends, went from place to place, vowing to be there till the end. The Last Supper they had together one night sharing the special time by candlelight. The time went on. Jesus went away to pray in the garden to his father. And there that night he stayed. Friends he needed right by his side. They could not stay awake as hard as they tried. Then deep in the night, when they weren't aware, their teacher and friend was taken from there. Good Friday came. How could this day be? Darkness came around for everyone to see. Dear Jesus, our Savior, our shepherd and friend, his death on the cross, was it truly the end? Even though with his hurting, tired soul, he asked his Heavenly Father to forgive humanity as a whole. And then after a time on that rough, rugged cross, Jesus took his last breath and the world seemed so lost. He was taken down and then he was laid in a tomb. And in heaven God waited to welcome him soon. A day like none ever before, that blessed, bright Easter morn came. Hope, joy, and everlasting life is given to all in Jesus' sweet and precious name. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Vanessa. We appreciate the thoughts and the effort and the poem. Amen. Amen. We have a hymn. <clears throat> Excuse me, good morning. Let us sing together up from the grave he arose.
20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They, did st they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I, asc I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. And now let us sing, Because He Lives.
come before you. What an awesome day this is. Easter morning. An empty tomb. A risen Savior. Eternal life. Oh, how we are blessed, Lord. Thank you for the love, the grace, and the mercy that you pour out. Thank you that you are such an awesome God. Thank you, God, for having a plan, a plan for all of us, for this world, for your creation, so that we might know eternal life with you. That death would no longer have its sting. That Christ, through an empty tomb, has given us the victory, the victory over death. Oh, how we love you, Lord. Thank you for the way you love us, the way you pour out your grace, your love, and your mercy. Oh, we need your grace, love, and mercy, God. Thank you. We praise your holy, holy name on this Easter morning. Thank you, God. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, on our communities, on all your people, and on this world. Lord, may we all come to know your grace and your mercy. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I'm reading from uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried. That he, had, he was raised from the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas. And then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Harder than all of them, the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. It's the word of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the reading. You know, I have to uh, confess. I need to be honest here. I have always, even as a child, enjoyed hearing sermons at church. Now, my friends would say, what? But I was just drawn into the stories that most pastors would so often share. Did I use a bad five-letter word there? S-T-O-R-Y? Story? Well, first let me define that word story. Story is A, an account of an incident or event. B, a statement regarding the facts pertinent to a situation. I don't, well, I do know that some of you like, don't like to hear that word story come out of a pastor's mouth. But today I've defined the word, an account of an incident or event, or a statement regarding the facts around the situation. The problem is that I think most 
people hear that word story and what they think of is a fable. Totally different thing. In fact, a fable is a literary genre consisting of a succinct or a small fictional story. I'm not talking about a fable. I'm not talking today about fiction. I am talking about a story. A story meaning an account of an incident or an event that is factual. This could be an example of a storybook. Okay? It's a photo album. So it doesn't have a great deal of words. In fact, I brought this from home. This is one of our photo albums. It could contain stories of adventures to family reunions in faraway exotic places like Conway, Missouri, or Marshfield, or Naylor, or Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Sometimes those reunions were all the way to Rockford, Illinois, and sometimes in Indiana. Good times, those family reunions. Hanging out with cousins, getting all those hugs and pinches from aunts and uncles. I could have done it without some of those pinches that day. It was always a delight to see our the matriarch of our family, Mima Drain. She was, before she passed, the matriarch within the family, and everyone was always delighted to see Grandma Drain at reunions. Never had an opportunity to meet my Grandpa Drain. His name was Charles. I think they called him Charlie. And he was a circuit rider, believe it or not. In the late 1800s, he rode a circuit in southern Missouri and northern Arkansas in the hills of the Ozarks. Now, if you're not familiar with a circuit rider, a circuit rider was a man who literally would, would get on his horse or his mule and ride a circuit. He was pastoring, if you will, several, several small congregations. Sometimes it would take six to 12 weeks to ride the circuit or the route that he had down. Well, I never knew my grandma or grandpa on my, the brown side of our family. Again, Missouri or Missouri roots. Naylor, Neelyville, Cape Girardeau, Poplar Bluff, which... The locals would call it the bluff or the cave. Those were all part of the Brown family. This album could tell you about a particular time or slice of time in our lives, perhaps. You know the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. This could tell you the story of my ancestors coming from the Isle of Man or England. Or it could tell of sporting events. Sometimes it's not about our whole family. Sometimes we made albums that were just about one child. Maybe they're sporting events. You know, I've noticed that as, as we get older that some of the descriptions of their accomplishments in those sports get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, Brooke? <laughs> well, this, this one actually just deals with the period of time when I was traveling with the FFA. Storybooks. Most of us are familiar with this storybook as well, aren't we? This book doesn't have any photos in it. Cameras weren't around when we were transcribing the Bible, recording the stories from an oral tradition to a written tradition. This, this story is from a God revealing himself to creation. Many would say that this story is a love story. 
A love story from a God because it, it, it consistently shares God's love for this world and for the people within it. It's an amazing love story. It tells us about God's desires for his people and how God blesses through his limitless love. Did you hear that? God has limitless Unlimited love for you. Today, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians is sharing a bit of this story. He gives hints to the church in Corinth that reveal this story. Today's story as, as simply the most recent and yet perhaps the most decisive moment in a much larger story. To know the larger story, you need to know this story. You need to be familiar with what is in this Bible, this Word of God. Let's look at today's scripture and see what God has for us on this Easter morning. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. And this is the Apostle Paul. He is, has written an epistle, a letter, to the church in Corinth. And that's why this book is called 1 Corinthians. Because it was written to people in the church in Corinth. Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you. Which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Right away, he's saying, friends, what did I teach you? I taught you the gospel, right? Verse 2. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Friends, Paul is saying here, it is by believing the gospel message that I received and shared with you that you are saved. You are saved by that gospel message. Verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, this is the important message for you. This is what I shared first. The gospel. Back to our scriptures. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What did we, uh, what did we call Friday? Last Friday? Good Friday. Good Friday. So when you, when you hear that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, think Good Friday. Jesus' death on the cross. Verse 4. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Folks, think Easter. Think Resurrection Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead three days. Three days. Back to the scriptures. According to the scriptures, in that, he appeared to Peter. And then, to the twelve, eleven, meaning the apostles or disciples. Verse six, after that, he appeared to more than... 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What Paul's saying there is that some are still alive, but some have, have passed on. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me. Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What's that all about? 
Let me tell you, it's funny you should ask. So, Paul here is being humble. And he wasn't feeling deserving of this calling from God. God who called him, Christ who called him, to be a disciple, a follower. His Christian birth, if you will, his coming to Jesus was so dramatically different than all the other apostles. And so here he's saying that I was raised up in the church in an abnormal way compared to those other apostles or disciples. Verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Remember, Paul was Saul. A murderer, a persecutor of the church. And Jesus knocked him off his high horse and, and he was converted. And then became Paul, the apostle. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Verse 11, then, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Now, I want to continue reading. Mark stopped it at 11, but I want to go on. Verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, back in these days, you know, we always heard about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Maybe that's why they were so sad. I don't know. It would make me sad, you see. Sorry, preacher humor. R, R, R. The Sadducees didn't believe, and neither did any of the pagan religions that surrounded Israel or God's people. They did not believe in a physical resurrection. And obviously some of the Corinthians were struggling with it as well. Because Paul addressed it in this letter to the church. Verse 13. There is no if. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Paul is just laying it on the line. Christianity and our belief in Christ is based heavily almost entirely on the fact that there was an empty tomb. That Jesus was raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. It's a primary or a foundational belief if you call yourself a Christian. So the question that you need to ask yourself, do I believe do I really believe Christ was resurrected? His body was raised from the dead, and that is why the tomb was empty. I think many of us believe that Jesus was the Son of God. That Jesus was God incarnate. That God took on flesh. Jesus took on flesh and lived among us. Why wouldn't God resurrect Jesus? After all, Jesus was deserving. But do you really understand that you too will defeat death because of the empty tomb? Because Jesus defeated death, you will defy death as well. Maybe not in this physical world, but in the kingdom of God, you may have eternal life. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Well, 
What's that you're thinking? But I don't deserve it? You know what? You're right. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. No one deserves it. Except. Except. Because of Jesus' actions on Good Friday, you will now rise with him on Easter. That is the symbolism. Let me repeat that because I don't want you to miss it. Because of what Jesus did on Good Friday, dying on a cross, atoning for your sins and mine, the sins of the world, then we can rise with Christ as he did on Easter. According to N.T. Wright's commentary, Paul for everybody, the Easter theme is resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the future resurrection of those who believe in Jesus. Resurrection is about Christ being resurrected and a future resurrection for all those who believe the gospel. Paul here in his letter is trying to get the Corinthians to understand who they are. Where they are within the story. That'd be a good thing to know, wouldn't it? Where am I in that story? Well, Paul's answered it. If you are a believer, you are a recipient. If you're a believer, you are a receiver. Amen? How awesome is that? Paul's trying to let the Corinthians know, the church of Corinth, that they belong to the Messiah who has brought Israel's long story to a climax. A climax of an empty tomb. A climax of death having no sting. Victory in Jesus. Gosh, someone should write a hymn, shouldn't they? The church in Corinth needs to learn to live according to the scriptures. They need to understand, but in a much larger sense, that the Bible, all of it, tells a story which is now blossomed with new life. Through the Messiah's death and resurrection. If they understand where they belong in the story, then so many things that have troubled them will, will seem different. Will be made clear. Because of the story. Now see, this part, this part is where that whole analogy of the photo album and the story kind of falls apart. Because it's hard for us to have a photo album with pictures in it of things that are yet to come. I wish that I had albums full of all the things my grandchildren are going to do. I wish I had albums that are full of all the things that those who come after me will do in their life. Wouldn't that be awesome? And yet within our story, the Bible, we know that there was this thing called prophecy. The gospel message is like a photo album, though. Think about this. This is the story which makes sense of who and where we are. Snapshots, snippets, if you will. A snapshot of a Messiah. Born in a manger. A snapshot of a little boy in the temple. A snapshot of Many Passovers observed. A snapshot of being raised. Nazareth, Galilee. Snapshots of miracles performed. Snapshots of parables being spoken. A snapshot of praying in the garden. 
a snapshot of a trial, a mockery of a trial, a snapshot of a man on a cross, God on a cross, a snapshot of a man being placed in a in a tomb, and then hallelujah, a snapshot of an empty tomb. And then snapshots of Jesus and Peter and Jesus and the other disciples, of Jesus in a crowd of 500, of Jesus alive. See, that's the story. That's the gospel message that we're all a part of. And that's what we celebrate on this day we call Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We have the ability... be alive with Christ. All those things happen according to or in accordance with God's holy word, the Bible. The Bible which Paul had grown up with. The Jews grew up with that Old Testament, didn't they? And it was a, a great story. But it was a story in search of an ending. N.T. Wright says, an ending of when Jesus rose from the dead. And that ending has now been revealed. This was where it was all going. God's awesome plan for salvation for all of us. God's plan of salvation for you. Today our sermon title was Alive with Christ and then three exclamation points, right? And then I also had three question marks. What's that about? Well, when you're a believer, you are alive with Christ. But also those question marks. Because if you are not a believer, I have to ask. You are you alive in Christ? The empty tomb on Easter morning is your opportunity to believe and live with Christ in the kingdom forever. You need to believe and receive. Did you catch that? You need to believe and receive. Receive eternal life. Amen. 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 We have a video to share again today. I hope you'll enjoy it and be blessed as we were. late that afternoon, the afternoon that Jesus died. All of the other followers of Jesus were gone, the male followers. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders, even though there was no obvious threat against them. We women had followed Jesus from Galilee, and we were not about to abandon him now. In the entirety of history, there has never been a week like this before or since. This monumental week started when a group of women visited the tomb of Jesus and found it empty. The dead Jesus had come back to life. There were several women there, including Jesus' mother and me, Mary Magdalene. I had followed Jesus faithfully since he had cast seven spirits out of me. We were exhausted, both mentally and physically. We only had a few hours sleep the previous night because the men woke us up after Jesus had been taken by the Jewish leaders. We stayed outside while Jesus was tried before the high priest, before the Sanhedrin, and before Pilate and Herod. 
We tried to quiet the crowd stirred up by the Jewish leaders, but our pleas had no effect. We were a devoted group, but a group of women. We watched the bloody Jesus carry his cross a short way before Simon of Cyrene had to help him. We followed as close as possible while the soldiers led him to Golgotha, laid him on the cross, and beat the nails into his hand and feet. Shuddering and, and all clustered together when the cross dropped into the hole in the ground. We listened to the two thieves on the other crosses berate Jesus, though one later changed his ways. Earlier, Mary, the mother of Jesus, got a new son when Jesus entrusted her to John. He had come by briefly. We heard Jesus say a few things through his clenched teeth and heaving lungs. Saw him get speared by the soldier. We watched his dead body get carried off by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. We followed them to the tomb saw them place the body in the tomb and waited until the stone was levered into place. It was over. We should have gone back into town to get ready to celebrate Passover. We women, we had to prepare, but Jewish rituals were abhorrent to us at this moment. Together, we sat in the darkness across from the tomb and prayed. Unlike the disciples, the men, we were able to stay awake and pray. Allow me to let you in on a little secret. During that whole ordeal, none of us, including Jesus' mother, wailed or cried as Jewish women typically did at the death of a loved one. We had full confidence that Jesus would make things right, as he had always done. We didn't know how or when, but we knew he would. That's why we stayed while the men abandoned Jesus. They did not yet have full faith in Jesus. We had no other options. The next day, Saturday, we rested and tried to celebrate the Passover as best we could. Against the rules of the Pharisees, I went around the city and gathered the things that would be needed to prepare the body of Jesus for the final burial. It proved difficult because nobody wanted to work or sell things on the Sabbath. But I was very persuasive. I knew that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had done their best, but neither of them had ever prepared a body for burial. That type of work was typically reserved for women. I heard that soldiers had arrived to further secure the tomb. The Jewish leaders were worried that the disciples would steal the body and claim Jesus was resurrected. So they convinced Pilate to make sure that didn't happen. He instructed them to take a guard, seal the tomb, and post soldiers to make sure nothing happened. Before dawn on Sunday, we gathered our things and headed to the tomb. We left quietly so as not to wake the others. I didn't have a clue what I was going to do when I got there. I mean, how could I roll back the stone? But the Holy Spirit urged me to go anyway. We arrived just as light was breaking, and I was sure nothing worse could happen than what had already happened. That's when the violent earthquake hit. Mary and I went to our knees. We saw a streak of light. It was a blinding light and an angel. An angel appeared before the tomb. It was giant and wore clothes as, as white as snow. And with, with a flick of its finger, the stone in front of the tomb was rolled back. The guards at the tomb fainted, and they were petrified with fear. It was, it was like they were dead. The angel said to us, do not be afraid. We knew then that this was a true angel, because that's what they often say when meeting humans. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. We stumbled into the tomb and saw the grave clothes laying there. But no body. The tomb had no body in it. The angel continued, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and is going to Galilee. There you will see him. 
If you ever talk to an angel, you will obey him immediately, just as we did. Stepping over the soldiers, we rushed to tell the disciples. The angel entrusted women to take the news of Jesus' resurrection. Can you believe it? The soldiers had recovered sufficiently, and while we went to the disciples, they went to the Jewish officials. The Jewish leaders bribed the soldiers to tell everyone that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus. Nobody needed an eyewitness like me to tell them the untruth in that statement. The soldiers would have been executed if such a thing had happened, and everyone knew it. Their very lives were a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. We got to the disciples, and they could not believe our news. Peter ran to the tomb to find out, but he was outrun by the younger John. John arrived, peeked in the cave, and saw the grave clothes laying in a heap as if a body just dematerialized through them. Peter came panting up and rushed by John into the tomb. He not only saw the grave clothes laying on the ground, but he saw the headpiece folded up. That is when he believed. No soldier would have taken the time to fold it. Peter and John returned to the disciples and gave them the incredible news. The body of Jesus was gone. What happened to me? I went back to the tomb to pray. As I stood outside praying and crying, I bent over to look in the tomb and saw two angels seated where Jesus' body had been. They asked why I was crying. I was incredulous at their question. They have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him. There was a noise and I turned and it was the gardener. I asked him where he had put the body if indeed he had moved it. Then one word changed everything. One word announced a change in the entire course of history. That one word was my name, Mary. It was Jesus. I rushed to hold him. I never wanted for him to leave me again. He told me not to hold on, but to go tell the others, which I did. Jesus had indeed risen. Jesus was alive. I went back to tell all the others, including the women, but honestly, I, I did not really expect any of them to believe me. But not long after that, Jesus appeared to Peter and then to the rest of the apostles. He eventually appeared to over 500 believers. And like the teacher he always was, Jesus opened their eyes to the meaning of the scripture they had read their entire lives. He proved to them that he was the Messiah. Based on what you know about me, you can probably guess what I did next. I went back to Galilee with the rest of the disciples and got to spend the next several weeks around them and the Lord Jesus. Maybe you're wondering about something, the same thing I used to wonder about. Why did Jesus pick me, a woman, a woman formerly possessed with seven demons to be the first person to know about his resurrection? Why me? Consider this instead. Why has he chosen you to know about him? Why do you get to have a Bible and hear the gospel story? Why do you get to see him through the lives of his followers? Why do you get to know the same thing I know? He is alive. Jesus is alive.
and you will have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper on this beautiful Easter morning. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I come before you now, praying over these elements of bread and juice. And not only these elements of bread and juice, but also all those elements of bread and juice that might be in, in homes where folks are participating in your holy supper. Or we just pray that even as we speak, your Holy Spirit is filling the bread, the crackers, the juice. Fill, fill them. Fill these elements with more and more and more of your Holy Spirit. Fill them so full with your Holy Spirit that as we partake with these communion elements that we too will be full of your Holy Spirit. So full in fact that as we interact with the world around us that they too will receive your Holy Spirit. That's our prayer, Lord. We pray it now in Jesus' holy and righteous name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 That night in the upper room, Jesus, along with his disciples and friends, he took bread and he gave thanks to you, Father, Abba, God. He turned to those in the upper room who were participating in that Passover meal, and he said, This, this is my body, which is given for you. Each time you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. And a little later, during that same Seder meal, Tradition tells us it was during the, the cup of redemption within that Seder meal that Jesus again, he lifted the cup and he gave thanks to you, God. And he turned to those in the room and he said this, this is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And again, each time you eat of the bread or drink of the cup, do it in remembrance of me. And so it is. That that is part of the story, isn't it? And on a day like today, we find ourselves as part of the story as we have the opportunity to participate with the bread, the body, the juice, the blood. The body and blood of a risen Savior. So for those of you who are participating in communion at home, I would say this. As you receive the bread or your cracker, the body of Christ given for you. And after you have received the bread, the body of Christ, then I would say this, and the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
victory in Jesus. Amen. If that doesn't get your blood going, I don't know what can. Jesus is awesome. Amen. Amen. We come to you today to, to offer prayer. We come to be in prayer with our Lord. So let us go to prayer. The Christian life is best served in prayer and service. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are amazing. You have given us our sweet Jesus, who has died on the cross for us. He suffered and went through so much pain for us. But the beautiful thing is that he came out on the other side and he now lives with you in heaven in your glory. Lord, we come to you today, praise you and worship you, of course, for you are an awesome God. But we have been asked by many to lift up prayers to you as well. And we know that you hear all of our prayers. And so I would just like to go through those for you, please. A daughter, Carrie, Nikki, Harley, friends, Steve, Nancy, Kathy, a grandson, Drew, and others who are all battling cancer. Frank and Kevin, recovering from strokes. Carol, Becky, Gary, Paul, Dorothy, who have been struggling with health problems. Andrea and Jason, in their upcoming move. Heather, for peace in her job. The many, many, many displaced workers who are struggling to live just to pay their bills and put food on their tables. All here and across the globe that need your strength, your healing, your love, your peace in their lives, now more than ever. Physically, emotionally, financially, mentally, and spiritually, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. But Lord, <laughs> your word says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And we know that living joy, for that joy is Jesus. He is the light and the hope of the world. And you sent him to be here and save us. You love this world so much that you gave your one and only son that he might be called, that we might be called your children too. So Lord, help us to live in the gladness and the grace of this Easter Sunday every day. Let us have hearts of thankfulness for your sacrifice. Let us have eyes that look upon your grace and rejoice in our salvation. Help us to walk in that mighty grace and tell your good news to the world, Lord. And all for your glory do we pray. Friends, are you alive in Christ? Think about that. Have a happy Holy Easter. For the tomb is empty, and he has risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. He has risen indeed, and we shall rise with him. Amen? Amen. 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 You know what? If you enjoyed our internet worship today, or perhaps the, the uh, viewing on cable channel 13, I hope that you were blessed. I hope that we brought God our praise, all the glory, and all the honor. That he has found our worship pleasing. If you are so inclined and would like to donate, I would direct you to our website, kiwaniumc.com, for an opportunity to give electronically. Or you could go old school and uh, actually write a check and mail it to us here in Kiwani, Illinois. Well, with that, I want to leave you with one thought, one snapshot to go in that photo album. 
All of us had the ability to close our eyes from time to time. And what if, what if when we close our eyes and we just see that darkness, that it becomes our reminder of an empty tomb that he left? Go in peace, go in love. Amen and amen. Thank you.